Hello, good afternoon everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, I'm doing very well. Uh, I am in the final week before I can start campaigning for local elections in May. And I know full well that for two months my focus, my time, will be on campaigning for election and I'm really looking forward to it. I really am. It's like spending two months at a gym for a start. Not that I particularly enjoy a gym, but I do enjoy getting out and about and getting some exercise. So I'm looking forward to it. And this week I've spent a great deal of time and I still have a small amount to do. Stuffing envelopes. It's um it's quite a job I have. <laughs> I love I say it all the time but I absolutely love my job. Um, and you never know quite what you're going to be doing. And on that, I, you, the last, I think it was two weeks ago when I last did this, this um, video, I talked about something, and I think I'm going to need this even more, though my time is going to be a lot more limited in the next two months. Uh, I think I'm going to need these things even more because of it, is the, um, this... The Art of Japanese Living, something I'm absolutely fascinated by. So I sent away for, um, what's it called? Let me just, Kintsugi, which is the repairing of old and broken things. So I sent away for a little kit to do this, because I love this idea that the so beauty found in imperfection and, and how if you, putting something back together again, it makes it more, it makes it unique, and, and obviously it does. So I sent away for this little kit and it arrived and the bowls you're supposed to break and put back together again were like this size. And I thought, that's going to be way too, what's the word, finicky, is that a word? Um, too small, basically, for me to, to work with. So I decided I was going to take a bowl out of my own kitchen and do that instead. And I tell you, it's taken me... It's taken me until today to actually break the thing. I did get a hammer to one of these little bowls and it wouldn't break. And I thought, this Kintsugi kit comes with unbreakable little bowls. So today I instead got a hammer and the poor dogs, poor dogs ran upstairs. I'm sure they thought I'd gone mad that I'd taken a hammer to plate out of the kitchen, a bowl out of the kitchen. And I thought, well, if I smash it to smithereens, it, it, you smash it to dust, it's hardly going to work uh, either. So I got the hammer and much to the dog's dismay, this is what I ended up with. It's not too bad. It's got a couple of little bits here uh, that is going to be somewhat jigsaw-like in putting back together. But now my worry is that the glue that comes with the little kit won't be strong enough to get out Oh, the trials and tribulations. So, But I am, despite having no time, I know I'm going to have basically no time in the next couple of months, I am determined to stick with these little challenges that I've set myself. And what it will require is time management and time management is an important skill in itself so i'm going to have to up my time management skills to make sure that i don't abandon my little challenges of putting bowls back together and uh, my little um van gogh paintingy things that i got i started all this stuff during lockdown and I've loved it. I have loved it. I've, got, of course, got my little my, uh, gloves here for gluing back a plate. Um, but I, I will. I'm determined to stick to this stuff. Um, and to challenge myself to the time management that will be required to give the vast bulk of my time to campaigning spend a little bit of time every day with my dogs, eat well, sleep well, and have some escape hobbies, Think little things to escape into. So I'm determined to improve my time management during this time as well. 
I just, there's something I'd love to say and I can't. And I was, I, I've just, just before I sat down, I was subjected to, and subjected to is the right phrase, I was subjected to a video clip from a Politics Live episode. And it was a Scottish MP, not MSP, MP, from the SNP, who is on this programme and had made statements of fact, which are not facts at all, and for which there is absolutely no scientific basis whatsoever, but were still stated as fact. She pretended that the Scottish government is consulting. I'll give you a clue what I'm talking about. It's about, it was about the Gender Recognition Act and changes that the SNP wanted to make to the Gender Recognition Act to make it easier for people to get a, these certificates that certify you've changed sex. And as it stands, you have to go through quite a, a period of time living as the other sex, whatever that means. The SNP want to make it easier. Essentially what they want to do is introduce self-identification. So if I sit here and say, I am a man, then I have to be treated. Everyone has to accept this. I think I probably said too much as it is. So I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this, these statements made by an MP, by an MP, which are completely devoid of any objective study, any objective truth, any scientific, any medical backing whatsoever. And she's stating these as if they do have all of that backing, as if this is a proven objective truth. And was pretending that the Scottish government was consulting on this. And there was another lady who was speaking in, expressing concerns about this. And essentially saying, well, you're not consulting us. You're telling us that this is what we'll accept and anyone else can go take a long walk off a short pier. And that is the way this, these consultations are undertaken. So this, there's a starting point, according to the SNP, according to the Labour Party, according even to the Conservatives. The starting point is that one can change sex. That's the starting point. After that, we can debate. The point is, of course, that that is the debate. And the debate is finished, as far as they're concerned, before the consultation takes place. So if you dispute this at all, you are excluded from the consultation, and yet they will still call it a consultation. But what drives me absolutely insane are these, we have MPs stating things that are just not true. The statement being uh, that people can be born in the wrong body. I don't know when this became a thing. I don't know when we, as a society, were meant to accept this as fact when there's no scientific or medical backing for it. But that was, that was the statement being made. And if you don't agree with that, then you're excluded from the consultation. And they still call it a consultation. And I, I steam coming out of my ears. And I thought to myself, I'm going to go now and do my stream, or video rather, and give a piece of my mind about this. And as I was coming down the stairs, I realised I can't give a piece of my mind about this. I can't actually say what I want to say because this is the party's YouTube channel and I can't risk, can't risk it. My own channel I get back in April sometime, which if I said what I want to say, I would probably lose it again in quick, quick succession. I did an article yesterday about how we have lost freedom of speech in the UK. And I don't think that that is necessarily a debate. I think that's actually a fact. I think we have lost freedom of speech in the UK. 
And if I can't say what I think, to I'm not I'm not trying to um, harm anyone. I'm not. I don't. My I I just want to express an opposing view to something that a member of parliament expressed as a fact, and I would like to do so without risking losing the YouTube channel. And I can't. That's the loss of free speech. And to me, it's a, it's a simmering problem something that if people are not allowed to, to speak they may react in different ways and I kind of I see this bubbling under the surface because I know how many people don't accept what they're being told by politicians and by the media and by, by the soap operas and yet they can't respond, they can't express themselves for fear of, as I described it yesterday, there are three ways that our free speech is being taken away. One is through legislation, another is through social conditioning and another is through public humiliation. And you will see, you will see people be humiliated in public. For example, on social media, it's probably the, the most uh, prolific example of this. And I, I read last week about a, a woman, an elderly woman, and she'd, she'd said something. She'd said, you, born, you die the same sex that you were born. And some lefty went on Twitter and saw that this woman was followed by a drinks company. And wrote on Twitter to this drinks company saying, did you know that you are following a hateful bigot, transphobe, etc, etc. The drinks company responded by saying, thank you for the heads up and unfollowed this woman. As if saying what she said was so unforgivable that she deserves this kind of public rebuke and this public humiliation and this public treatment as if she has done something terribly, terribly wrong. And legislation is similar. And we've had the courts rule that anyone who disputes the official narrative, for example, on the transition, but not only on that, uh, don't have democratic rights. And there is actually a, a judge who said that there is no place for the a dispute with the mainstream trans narrative in a democratic society. That's the opposite of the case. In a democratic society, we ought to be able to dispute this. We ought to be able to debate it, discuss it. But we can't. And even our judges are saying that the open discussion on this has no place in a democratic society. It's enough to make you just want to tear your hair out. It's absolutely infuriating and it's so 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 important that we get our free speech back on less infuriating matters what have i would have been doing i haven't caught up with as you know uh, with my plate fixing i will i'll be back doing this again in two weeks time and i will show you my attempt at fixing the plates and my hope that the glue will work, but I am going to continue with that. Though I'm not entirely sure the glue will be strong enough. I've been reading quite a bit, um, and that's something that I intend to do, to continue to do. There's a, I, you might remember the, there was an ITV drama on a while ago about Dennis Nilsson, and there's a little bit of controversy surrounding him lately in that he's written an autobiography and you can get that autobiography on Amazon and other uh, major sellers. And people are arguing and, and complaining that he shouldn't be making money out of this. And, and, and I actually quite agree, to be honest with you. However, 
it, I, I perhaps I, I don't think I'm going to read his book. Uh, I don't think I could stomach it, to be honest. Now I'm wondering whether I, I'm being a little bit. No, I don't think I will read it. I don't think I could read it. But isn't it interesting to hear? Isn't there something we could? Well, this is debatable, um, and it's a genuine question. Is there something we can learn from hearing from a person uh, directly from someone like Dennis Nelson? If you if you don't know who Dennis Nelson is, this is a book that I've been reading lately. And what prompted me to read it was this drama on, on ITV. And I'd heard that uh, David Tennant had done uh, an incredible performance as, as Dennis Nelson. So I decided to watch it and it was an incredible performance. I did think that, you know, this is such an a interesting and horrifying story that why don't why doesn't anyone make a movie out of it? Over the weekend I was watching a three part drama made by the BBC about John Christie who was a who killed murdered a series of women back in the in the forties and fifties. Excellent drama and Tim Roth Incredible performance. Um, actually, that was the second movie made about John Christie. Who the first one was made in the nineteen seventies, and Richard Attenborough played him, and also an excellent film, an excellent performance. And I do love to watch good acting. I'm fascinated by acting. At some point in my life, I would love to take part just in a in a play, in a local play, whatever it might be. I really do find acting fascinating. So when someone gives a really strong acting performance, I I want to watch it just for that reason. And Richard Attenborough incredible it's 1971 it's called um the original was called 10 rillington place which is the address at which these murders took place and the bbc three-part drama i think was just called rillington place oh anyway, excellent so i'd heard about uh david tennant's performance as dennis nelson so i watched it and that prompted me prompted me to read this book and on reading the book it there's actually a warning in the book when you get to a certain chapter, there's actually a warning. What you're about to read will thoroughly horrify you. And when reading it, I realised, well, you can't make a movie out of this because it wouldn't, it wouldn't, wouldn't get past censored. Astonishing, astonishing, um, astonishing story. And I often, I often think that we should pay attention to these things in honour of the victims, so Dennis Nelson is a, was a serial murderer um, in London. In the, he was arrested in 1983 and his catalogue of horrors was, became public and he's now written an autobiography. And there are complaints about his ability to write or not. He is, of course, in prison. Um, anyway, I, I, I find I find the whole thing thoroughly fascinating and, and I read I read this and I I'm interested in these things for the same reason that I watched the documentary Earthlings and that documentary genuinely haunted me for weeks afterwards people have asked me do I recommend that they watch it and I usually say no because it's horrifying, and Earthlings is a uh, it's a documentary showing video footage of cruelty to animals, and I remember seeing a interview with the producer and director of Earthlings, and he said, "I want people to watch it for for the animals." It's the same thing, I think. For the in the name of the victims. And to honour the victims, if you like, of people like Dennis Nelson. Let's not let them fade into memory. Let's not ignore what happened to them. Let's recognise their lives, recognise the horrific way that they died and, and keep their memory alive in some way. I had some time ago, I've never told this story actually, I had... Um, before the UKIP leadership election started and my life changed beyond all recognition forever, I and a friend of mine were going to do a 
Ripper Walk. And a Ripper Walk is a walk around, and there are several of them in East London, a walk, a guided walk around sites involving Jack the Ripper and telling the story of Jack the Ripper. And what we had, myself and my friend, what we decided to do, because most of these Ripper Walks don't go to all five murder sites, we were going to be the first and only to, well, I don't know if it's the first, but the only, certainly that we knew of, that was going to go to all of the five murder sites. And we, we, we rehearsed this many, many times and walked from, we walked from site to site to see if we could get it into an hour, and we could. And we'd written scripts for it and what we were going to say. And, and one thing that we had decided to do was talk about the victims as well as who might have been Jack the Ripper. I think I, I'm, I'm fairly convinced um, about who Jack the Ripper was. But we were going to talk about the victims and bring them into the equation and talk about who they were and where they came from and how they ended up as prostitutes in the East End. And that was going to be our unique flavour for it. And we, like I said, we, we rehearsed it many, many times and, and we, would, we had it fairly well polished. I did lots of research into the victims and their lives. And then along came the UKIP leadership election and my life has never been the same again. And I, well, lots of things went out the window in that, at that time. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's why um, I'm interested in these things. I'm more interested, well, I'm a horror fan, and these are real life horrors, aren't they? And I, I don't particularly understand the, the, well, there are theories around why people are fans of horror. It's, it's adrenaline or um, the security of knowing that in this fictional account that the, the good usually win, and this is a, it's almost a, a reaffirming thing of, of you know, fighting evil um, and that good conquers evil and, and that's just, I actually spoke to a psychologist friend of mine about this years ago we talked about being a horror fan anyway part of the reason I'm so interested in this is because I'm so interested in victims and, and victims and who they were where they came from and in remembering them um, so for that reason, I'm a little bit conflicted about the notion that Dennis Nielsen should publish his own autobiography. I'm fully, I fully understand both sides. I don't think he should make any money out of it. However, money aside, should we hear from him? It's quite an interesting, uh, quite an interesting question. I didn't actually intend when I sat down to do the stream to consider that question. Um, let me know what you think. I'd, I'd like to know uh, what people think about that. Okay, as I say, next two months I'm going to be campaigning and campaigning and campaigning and campaigning and I am really looking forward to it. I feel completely differently going into this campaign than I ever have before. I feel so much more uh, prepared and confident and optimistic and ready if you like ready um it's going to be a lot of hard work and i'm up for it i'm really i'm really I, i'm excited about it i'm excited about the challenge and i intend to knock on every door in the ward that i'm standing in and to speak to the people out there and more importantly to listen to. I know it sounds like political politicians waffle, it's not. I really do want to hear what people are thinking because I'm fine. You know, we are living in an era of mass of widespread censorship. And I I often find that when people talk to me, when they find out, you know, that I'm politically incorrect and that I myself won't go along with the agenda and I insist on saying what I really think. Uh, at least in, in person, I'm not going to, as I said, I'm not going to risk the party's YouTube. It was my YouTube account, be different. Um, but I won't be bullied into thinking what I don't think. And when people, when I get into conversations with people about this, about controversial subjects or political correctness or whatever it may be, and that becomes apparent, 
it's amazing how people then feel like they can open up and say what they think because they know that they're safe to say these things to me. And that's when the reality comes out. And there is a hidden majority in this country who are thinking the same things, but afraid to say so. And I'm looking forward to going out there, knocking on doors, making it clear to people that they are safe to tell me what they really think. And I am looking forward to hearing what people really think. So I'm going to keep up all of these things. Oh, I just, I did my first um, Facebook stream. I mean, I'm on Facebook now. I'm getting to grips with it slowly. It is a little bit of a minefield to me. I'm someone who was, my only real social media experience is Twitter. And I find, it, find Twitter really, really different to Facebook and much easier to use than Facebook. No longer, of course. I'm, I was thrown off Twitter for questioning the police, but there you go. So I'm on Facebook now and making the most of it. And I did my first stream on there this morning, live stream. Um, and I'll be doing it again next Wednesday, so do join me on there next Wednesday at 10 o'clock and every Wednesday at 10 o'clock from now on. I'm going to be talking about mostly Hartlepool and local issues here. And, but the, these issues are the same issues that people have all over the country and how common sense policy can solve a lot of these problems. But this morning I had some, some guests, some lefties. They are a pleasant lot, aren't they? I wish, you know, you'd think that they would try to prove me wrong occasionally instead of constantly proving me right. I'm sorry, but they do. I will, you know, I, I mentioned this morning that the left, I actually, I was talking about my own, because somebody had asked me what my political journey was. So I thought, well, given it's the first stream, I'll take the opportunity to do a bit of an introduction. So if there are voters in, in Hartlepool who don't know where I come from, what I stand for, I think this, the first stream was the appropriate time to do that. So I covered my own political history, and I, of course that includes my time in the Labour Party. And <laughs> I talked about how the extreme left had begun to dominate the Labour Party and with that you have censorship and you have bullying and you have people afraid to say what they think and it has now gone from the internal of the Labour Party to wider society and for the same reasons, bullying, tantrum throwing by the left and the absolute insistence that everybody think as they do or if they don't then at least pretend they do and the absolute insistence on shutting down everybody who even just wants a debate just wants a an open honest debate about things who has a different perspective on things they won't allow it the, the extreme left won't allow this they they censor and in in when they can they kill they kill their political opponents we, you know you only need to look at China or the Soviet Union to know what actually happens to people who dissent in a communist, for example, society, an extreme left society. So I've no doubt at all that the extreme left here in Britain would if they could. And I don't think I'm being alarmist or dramatic or, or exaggerating. I think they would if they if they could. They would they would kill their opponents. I have, and the reason I think that is because the absolute dripping, angry hatred that is expressed, and that was expressed this morning in some of the comments on my Facebook stream. And the irony is, of course, that they accuse me of hatred when I don't express hatred to anyone because I don't feel hatred. I feel hatred for certain things. I feel hatred towards for, for cruelties and, and oppressive, and, and, and but hatred is an emotion. And I think when you're confronting evil, it can be a, a healthy one. It, you, you, we must be able to hate cruelty and oppression and rape and child abuse. And I do hate those things. And I, it's an emotion. It's a strong emotion that I feel. But I don't hate people. And I certainly don't hate people who are simply because they disagree with me politically. But if you watch these, these comments that people throw in, they are dripping, dripping in anger and hatred. 
And I've said on the stream that you can't debate. You know, these people will not debate. They won't engage in an honest debate. They will try to censor you. And one of the ways will be through public humiliation, which is part of which is being labelled a racist or a fascist or far right or bigot or hate monger. Oh, you know, pick one. And just as if, you know, as if I, on cue, on cue, you know, I'd said, these people don't debate, they won't engage in open discussion. All they try to do is smear and attack and call you scary names and then shut you down. And that is the, that is the, that's their, their, their portfolio. That's what they do. And as if on cue, they started popping up and saying the usual stuff with anger and with venom and I don't feel those that, that I'm not I just I would never lower myself to go on to someone else's stream and start spewing this nonsense again I I, I wish I wish they knew how much they they motivate me. I wish they knew how much I understand that I must be doing something right when I get responses like this. And people do say to me after I get a tirade of of hatred like this, you know, people say you are right. You know, you I it's so reinforcing to me if people like this are trying to shut you down. You have got to be doing something right. If they cannot and will not engage in the points that you're making and instead just throw names and angry vitriol around, you've won. You're winning. You're winning. And when they do this, I know I'm winning. And it, re it reinforces my optimism and my confidence and all of that. So please, lefties, keep it up. Keep making a public spectacle of yourselves. It does nothing but make me feel stronger. And reinforces the truth of what I'm saying. Because if you had any argument in response, you'd use it. You don't. And that's the point. Okay. I'll finish as I always do on these. Um, with my inspirational quotes. I do love these um this is from the book <laughs> i do this every week as well words of wisdom inspirational quotes on i'm going to give you the full title inspirational quotes and thoughts on optimism success fear overcoming failure persistence and resilience that will change your life that's the name of the book in full so we're on to number 28 it says here okay so we'll do three as we do this is from Aristotle Onassis. It is during the darkest moments that we must focus to see the light. You will see more of what you concentrate on. That's why once you listen to a song, it seems to be played on all the radio stations. Or when you want to buy a new red car of a certain type, you suddenly see that car everywhere. Use it to your advantage. You control your life experience by controlling your focus, by controlling where you put your attention. If you want to see more light, Focus on the light. If you want to see more happiness, focus on everything you can be happy about right now. If you have fallen, focus on your future goal and get up and go for it. In the darkest moments, focus on how you have overcome problems and have been strengthened by them. Focus on growth. As you can probably guess, I agree with every word of that. It's not always easy in times like the times that we are living in. And what a time to be alive when uh, an MP on television can make a statement and make it sound like a statement of fact when it is never been debated, the science has never been looked at, the science has never been agreed, the science has, there's no science has got no part in this. And yet it sounds like a scientific fact and is presented as a scientific fact and you're not allowed to dispute it, yet you'd be called a, a fascist probably. What a time to be alive. But it's not always easy in times like that when you are a truth seeker or a dissenter against the mainstream narrative. 
But you've got to keep yourself. You've got to keep yourself positive, and it, it kind of chimes with what I've just said about the hate that and the vitriol that is thrown at me, or was thrown at me this morning. Was regularly thrown at me, but was thrown at me this morning on Facebook. It is such a. It is. It's. It's. It's such a, a an empowering thing for me. Because I know. I know I must be on target if I am attracting that kind of vitriol from people who know they have no argument, who know they can't defeat me in an open and honest debate. So all they've got left is this. And some of it is quite obscene. And, and you know, no decent person would behave like that in public. I, gr I get so much strength from it. And I think that's kind of in, in tune with, with that focus on on the positive even in the darkest moments okay this one's from brian tracy i confess i don't know who brian tracy is but it's a similar one optimism is the one quality more associated with success and happiness than any other more than a decade of research in the fields of positive psychology and neuroscience confirms what brian tracy told us years ago we become more successful when we are happier and optimistic Optimistic salespeople, for example, sell a whopping 56% more than their pessimistic counterparts. Other studies show that optimism can make CEOs 15% more productive. They also have healthier teams that perform better, but it doesn't stop there. Happy and optimistic managers can also improve customer satisfaction by 42%. So yes, learning to interpret events optimistically leads to much higher success and more happiness and it strengthens our biological and psychological immune systems. Optimists even live longer. The best thing is that optimism can be learned. I think that's quite a kind of obvious, really. If, if a person, I mean, I'm not suggesting for a second that any of this is easy, but what's worthwhile isn't really easy. And if you can, find the silver lining i think it's obvious that you'll probably be more we're happier um and you'll enjoy challenges more undertake them with more positivity and more confidence and with that are far more likely to succeed okay anatole france again i'm not sure who this is uh here's the quote to accomplish great things we must not only act but also dream not only plan but also believe if you want to accomplish great things then acting is not enough you must also dream the dream will keep you going when things become difficult but dreaming is not enough because dreaming alone doesn't get things done you must also act the bless the best plan is not enough if you don't believe you can achieve it and believing by itself will not get you there if you don't know where you're going dream act plan and believe every single action by itself is not enough if one of the ingredients is missing then it, then it will be difficult to achieve your goals. It's the sum of the four that will get you anywhere. I have, since I started for Britain, I have maintained both in my own head and in speeches that if you don't believe you can do it, you won't. You have to believe that you can achieve things. And while it's easier said than done, it is absolutely necessary to to be optimistic and to believe in things. And I, I'm going to keep going with this book. The messages are similar, but I think that they're the kind of messages that should be repeated over and over and over again. And, and repetition is actually how your brain accepts things through repetition it becomes part of your of your brain uh, and your subconscious mind and then it becomes uh, the foundations on which you operate so repetition is important okay um that's it for me for this evening oh tonight i am on myself and future for britain megan and alex are on wake up uk tonight at nine o'clock tune in if you can to that tomorrow i'm going to be filming uh, manifesto and policy video so there won't be any stream as I said on my live stream on Monday because of the election things that have been weekly are now going to be fortnightly so like this video um, the economics blog 
um, the Thursday night stream book review not giving any of them up but they are going to be fortnightly now to give me a little bit more time to to campaign and to focus a little bit more on uh, things like for example I'm going to be producing a lot more policy uh, output videos articles um, live, live stream on Facebook on Wednesday mornings so be changing uh, what I do for the next couple of months to focus a lot more on the election. Monday night's live stream will stay. That's going to stay now permanently. Wednesday morning's stream will also stay permanently. Other things may come and go, but these things that have become a bit of a staple of mine throughout the lockdown will become fortnightly instead of weekly to give me a bit more time to focus on campaigning. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for joining me. Join me tonight at nine o'clock on Wake Up UK uh, and I shall see you on my live stream on Monday. Take care of yourselves until then. Bye bye.